Okay, so I'm Agnieszka Twasińska and uh, I would like to welcome you to Ecagothic Landscapes, um, which is a series of talks, meetings, conversations, lectures organized by Weird Fictions Research Group at the American Studies Center, University of Warsaw. Uh, and it is my great pleasure to welcome our second guest uh, this semester, Alison Sperling, uh, who in conversation with Philip Boratin will be talking about uh, weird fiction and ecological thought. Uh, so let me start by briefly introducing our guest uh, and our interlocutor, uh, Philip, as well. So Alison Sperling is currently an International Postdoctoral Initiative Fellow at the Technische Universität Berlin in Zentrum, uh, Zentrum für Interdisziplinäre Frauen und Geschlecht for Geschlechterforschung. Okay, I should have written that, should have read that in English, it was easier. Uh, so <laughs> my German is really rusty at this point, it's almost dead. Okay. okay, Center for Interdisciplinary Women and gender studies. Okay, I'm blushing. Okay, uh, she works on weird and science fiction, feminism and queer theory, and contemporary art in the Anthropocene. And uh, her interlocutor um, will be Philip Boratin, who is a PhD student at the Doctoral School of Humanities, University of Warsaw. Much easier. Uh, his dissertation project focuses on the cultural work of enchantment in the contemporary ecological imagination. He recently received the 2020 David G. Hartwell Emerging Scholar Award from the International Association for the Fantastic in the Arts for his paper, Magics of the Anthropocene, Enchantment uh, versus Terroir in Jeff Vandermeer's Southern Reach. So I'll cede the floor to Ali, who will explain more how this talk is going to be conducted. Ali, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction um, and to Philip for agreeing to talk with me and uh, accepting some kind of chaotic emails over the last few days of me kind of changing the format multiple times and being so flexible. So thanks and thanks to you both um, and to the American Studies Center and the university for having me. Um, so we're going to think today under this banner of weird fiction and ecological thought. Um, and I know and uh, am aware of the fact that um, Zoom fatigue is very real. A lot of you are teaching on Zoom, attending meetings um, on Zoom, attending classes. And so if it's more comfortable for you to chill and shut your camera off and be present in whatever way is good for you, please do that. We'll have some time in the end to come back to discussion. And, um, and you're welcome to come back and join us um, if you'd like. So I thought I would try and squeeze a little bit of pleasure out of our meeting today by um, focusing a bit more than I usually do on some primary texts and reading perhaps like longer, um, longer primary texts than literary texts than I normally would. So I think typically I would set up this kind of theoretical frame, which I'm still going to do, but I've shortened that quite a bit to give us some time to read out loud together um, for examples um, of some weird ecological, um, some weird eco fiction. So um, um, I know that all of us are coming here today with a little bit different expertise in the weird. Uh, this is a weird fictions reading group, so many of you have been uh, reading weird fiction together, I think, since at least 2018 is my understanding, so it's been ongoing for some time. So uh, forgive this introductory material, some of which will feel very familiar to you, but I also know that there are people visiting us who may not have quite as much um, familiarity. So I'm going to start with just a little quick overview. And I'm going to lay out uh, four uh, kind of basic tenets of um, the weird that I think are really useful for thinking ecologically and vice versa. Um, and Philip has generally generously agreed after this first section uh, to um, we'll read these these passages together, and in between we'll have a kind of short discussion between the two of us, and and then move on to the next passage. At the end, there'll be plenty of time to um, bring them together, hopefully, um, as a group. Just say hi to everyone. Yes, hi, Philip. <laughs> cool. Um, so, I, uh, yeah, as Agneska said also, as we read the passages later, feel free to post in the chat any questions or observations that come up because Philip and I can also look at these and, um, and bounce them around if, if it. Uh, so, uh, the first slide, please, Ola. So, um, for those of us new to the weird, it has uh, multiple genealogies that have been traced um, in scholarship, and it depends uh, kind of on where and when you're looking at the weird. Kate Marshall has written, for, for instance, that it, it begins in the 19th century. Uh, it certainly has ties to the Gothic, to both Europe and U.S. Anglophone literature, at least that I've read so far, but um, certainly as weird scholarship continues to develop, um, I think that it can be located elsewhere. Um, so, 
As many of you probably already know, the weird is most often associated with H.P. Lovecraft, whose um, life from 1890 to 1940 really quite neatly brackets the modernist period, which is one that I um, am writing my first, finishing my first book manuscript, manuscript on titled Weird Modernisms, um, and is also associated with this pulp magazine, Weird Tales, founded in Chicago in 1922, um, and featured works by all sorts of um, really well-known uh, weird writers, Robert E. Howard, Clark Ashton Smith, and, and so forth. Um, Lovecraft's 1927 essay, Supernatural Horror in Literature, lays out quite clearly a lot of the basic tenets of weird writing, some of which I'm going to touch on um, in a second, and others we can leave for another day. Um, the weird as a word, its etymological roots are in the twisting and the turning, um, and in the fatalistic. So its etymology both has this interest in a temporal and a spatial dynamic, which is really important in my scholarship. Uh, there's a distinction made now and perhaps a new one emerging that we could talk about um, in Q&A between the old and the new weird, um, the latter of which really radically rejects the racism, xenophobia, and misogynism of Lovecraft's weird in a new weird mode. And a lot of this um, is marked by around the turn of the century, uh, China Mieville's Perdido Street Station in 2000. Um, so the weird has this reemergence at a particular time, which I think is, um, is, is still very much ongoing and has continued to gain a footing in the past few years as a, um, a cultural mode uh, most explicitly right now concerned with confronting and rejecting racism and the horrors of racism. Um, for me, in, in this talk, I'm, I'm less interested in weirdness as a genre and more as a mode. Um, the Vandermeers have, have said, and uh, I can't remember which edited collection, that, that it's something that you know when you feel it, right? It's, it can't always be identified by its formal qualities, but it has a kind of affective sense, a kind of visceral affective sense. Um, and so I like to think about um, how weirdness has uh, some qualities that may be formal, linguistic, um, visual. The first example we'll look at will be a clip from um, Alex Garland's adaptation of Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation. Um, and affective, so that we might identify that um, while acknowledging that what is weird or weirdness can vary wildly, um, it is expressed differently in different uh, periods and by different creators. So I have four mashed up messy tenants of the weird. Um, they were originally six, and then I had four textual examples, so I thought, well, I'll just make them four. So now they're a little, um, let's see if they're coherent and how they go. Um, but i ready for the next slide, please, Ola. So weirdness contains uh, one of the primary paradoxes and conflicts of the Anthropocene, as we know it, as a term. There is an impending sense of human insignificance temporally, as a species we're a mere blip on a vast timeline of the universe, and a kind of tension, uh, indeed potential political danger that this feeling can represent or can present. On the one hand, weird fictions force a recognition of anti-anthropocentrism, um, or the acknowledgement that human life or humanity is not hierarchically more important, significant, or valuable than other forms of life or non-life. And this can be very powerful. If we think, for example, um, in terms of environmental ethics or politics, preservation and conservation, uh, things like granting rights to rivers as if they are ours to grant, uh, the extraction of natural resources um, uh, to fuel consumer capitalism is challenged in this kind of um, structure. Um, and this notion, which comes largely out of Lovecraft, has been taken up in ecological thought by a number of philosophers who also work on environmental and ecological questions, uh, Eugene Thacker, Patricia McCormack, Ben Woodard, and Stephen Shaviro, amongst others. And on the other hand, this human insignificance and the recognition that we are not as important as we think um, can be also a dangerous position um, that many uh, climate change deniers or other kinds of conservative positions can use to justify change in global temperature, biodiversity loss, um, and shifting global we weather patterns, um, right? Like this is just the natural way of the world. Humans are not so important that we have made such dramatic alterations. Um, and so we can see the ways in which the kind of cosmic pessimism coming out of, um, of the Lovecraftian weird mode um, can be taken up in really radically different ways. And I think perhaps this is um, what is, 
um, dangerous, but keeps me also very theoretically invested and interested in the weird and its ability to be mobilized so, so differently, um, but simultaneously feeling uh, that there is a way in which weirdness captures something about contemporary experience and particularly the ways in which we relate to eco ecological devastation, catastrophe, and kind of the looming threats of the Anthropocene and its effects like climate change. Um, you know, but of course, recognizing that this framing of the Anthropocene is, is really just one of, of many. Slide please, Ola. So uh, Lovecraft was really, uh, so I'll just read, uh, the threat of the weird festers in the speculative, the forever receding future event that never will arrive, dread. So Lovecraft was really um, quite clear about this quality of the weird in his essay. Uh, and it's the focus, uh, at least for the first half of Graham Harmon's book, Weird Realism, uh, which lays this out quite clearly in his reading of Lovecraft's Call of Cthulhu, 1928, I believe. Uh, we only see the outline of the form, but never the thing itself, right? So the weird is always about the horror that is scratching on the outside of the door, the sounds of the beating wings, but never seeing the creature. It's a general atmosphere um, of dread, of a horror that is forever withheld from your beholding. So the weird lives in the fear of what might be, this kind of speculative horror. Um, and this affect of dread, and I would direct you to um, Tyler Bradway just wrote this excellent essay in the recent issue of uh, Weird Temporalities that I co-edited with Jordan Smith Carroll. And if anyone has a link to it, feel free to post it in the chat um, or I can send it later. Um, uh, but this effect of dread, one could argue, is a primary affect of the Anthropocene, right? That the end is near, but we don't know how near, we don't know how these things are going to play out. Uh, we have an apocalypse-obsessed media culture. Uh, and yet there must also be, and I think uh, Weird Studies has a lot of work to do on this front still, uh, the recognition that um, the recognition that as Black and Indigenous scholars of the Anthropocene have pointed out, especially uh, scholars like Kyle White, the apocalypse has already come and gone for many peoples at the hands of settler colonialism across the world and the enslavement of Black Africans. So I think that there's still quite a bit to do in terms of the temporality of the Anthropocene and ecological thinking in relation to the weird um, and different cultural perspectives. So as much as I want to emphasize ecological dread in these texts, it's also important to think um, harder about how indigeneity or blackness inflect the temporality and affect of weirdness in crucially altering ways. Uh, and I think this is in part uh, the project of this new weird racial horror. Like if there is something, you know, I haven't yet figured out if, if this, what's emerging now is part of the new weird or if it's something kind of slightly different, um, something like Lovecraft Country um, is an example of this. So, but in short, uh, for this, in short or in long, I guess, uh, weirdness grapples with this horror of an encounter that can never be described, right? It is the thing that cannot quite be pinned down, can never be explained or understood in full. In ecological terms, Thacker is so interested in Lovecraft in thinking extinction or afterlife, because it is not possible to think after oneself. So it is for Thacker the limits of thought itself to think extinction, uh, to think the world without us while we are of the world. Um, and weirdness confronts these limits of thought and the limits of representation. And I think uh, this is uh, why weird fiction has such an ecological bent and is read so often alongside theories of the Anthropocene. I would point you to Gree Olstein's work who's written quite a bit on Vandermeer and the Anthropocene and the weird. Uh, because climate change and the scale at which humanity has altered the course of the planet in the geological strata, um, it is both visible but also unfathomable. The temporality uh, at which environmental change is occurring is both incredibly fast and incredibly slow and imperceptible at the same time. Uh, so three, uh, there lingers a sense of wrongness. The laws of the universe are unstable and unclear. Science is refutable. Nature is perverse. The world is unknowable. So the wrongness, this sense of wrongness is something that Mark Fisher talks about. And, um, and I won't talk about it too much, um, too much right now, but it's something that I'm really interested in, in the ways in which I might pair queer theory and the weird. And so this, this kind of pairing of the differences and the ways that the weird and the queer together can, um, can think about a kind of perverse, perverse nature, um, contaminated and toxic, um, a kind of um, a kinky nature that thwarts cisgender and compulsory heterosexual desire with its very toxicity. And so this is a kind of thing that's circulating in my mind that I will return to um, at some point. 
Um, so I particularly read the weird through queer and feminist science and technology studies and ask about what is this relation between um, science fiction and especially science and the weird. Um, oftentimes it is a refusal in the weird of the uh, kind of supremacy granted to white colonial sciences of the global north and science with a capital S, right? So the primacy of this form of science is challenged in relation to other forms of knowledge and worlding. It's a destabilizing of what many think of as the foundations of the universe, biology, physics, mathematics, um, I think this is something both old and new weird cultural texts share in their kind of multiverse, multi-division, uh, dimensional visions of a world in which really the laws of physics um, do not have the final say. Um, artist Mary Magic actually posted this in her Instagram this morning, this excerpt from Stephanie Maroney's work. Um, and, and, and Maroney writes, Western colonial science has always been the project of extraction and control tied to purity tied to a desire to take in all of the world and control it, categorize it and make sense of it through a very narrow understanding of the world. So I think um, in part, this is what makes weird fictions so slippery and hard to pin down, right? It is, um, as far as genre goes, it is horror. It's a little bit of science fiction and speculative fiction. It can, it can dip its toes into the fantastic and, and it builds worlds where we can't really always identify the rules of the universe. Um, and as science fiction, I think readers were very used to um, used to being kind of disoriented in some time while we get a foothold in the kind of universe or world that we're in. But I think the weird really refuses this either entirely or for a lot longer. Um, so we find this kind of sense of disorientation. And I think this is especially true in relation to nature and to environment, right? What constitutes nature? Uh, where does nature end and I begin? Uh, and what are the stakes of this question of boundaries um, is a core concern of weird ecofiction that interests me. And number four, transform or perish, perish and transformation. These bodies have never been human. So my manuscript, Weird, uh, weird Modernisms, uh, develops this idea of weird embodiment. Um, the notion that, of course, the, the human is never fully human, has never been fully human, um, or is always non-human, um, itself already a category developed in the name of, of white male supremacy to begin with. Of course, all bodies are transformed in the Anthropocene. We all, I think now, uh, carry traces of microplastics, silica. We are increasingly radiotoxic and naturally um, uh, gender, sexuality, and desire also change in relation to these effects in ways that cannot simply be measured with um, scientific tools or data. Um, and I'd point you towards the, the work by Michelle Murphy, who is um, an Indigenous Studies scholar and Disability Studies scholar who talks about ways in which we might um, uh, gauge questions of toxic bodies and toxicity um, outside of what she calls a data of damage. So I think this is really an interesting way to start thinking about that. So in what ways do toxicity, pollution, changing environments also change how we relate to each other and how we express and experience um, gendered, racialized, differently abled and disabled embodiment? And so I have this kind of uh, list here of a bunch of queer and feminist science and technology uh, studies thinkers and new materialists whose work on um, questions of transcorporeality, viscous porosity, um, uh, confronting questions of purity, uh, all have really informed um, the way that I think about weird fiction. Um, and I'm happy to share those with anyone that's interested later or, or can bring some of that stuff into the discussion. But, but again, yeah, anyone can feel free to email me for any of these texts that I'm kind of breezing through. So uh, with that said, this kind, of, this kind of overview of these four or six or whatever tenets of, um, of the ways that I, I'm hoping we can use some of these thoughts to read these texts together, um, I wanna start with uh, a clip.
So this is a clip, uh, a shorter clip than the one I had planned, which was going to be about four minutes um, of, of The Shimmer. And this is from Alex Gar Garland's adaptation of Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation. Uh, the Annihilation, uh, Annihilation is the first book of the trilogy, the Southern Reach trilogy, which all three came out in 2014. Uh, and this film is from 2018. Um, and so I've been working with the novels um, and stories of Vandermeer uh, for some time, and um, and I think actually it was really his his stuff that first got me interested in this kind of weird ecology, weird biology, as he calls it. Um, and so um, this moment comes. Um, so let me just give you a sense of. I'm sure a lot of you have read it, but let me give you a sense of the the story. The novel is the first of the trilogy um, of the same name and um, is really kind of difficult to describe, but it follows a group of four highly skilled, trained women of different backgrounds and disciplines who embark on what is the 12th, uh, following 11 unsuccessful missions into what is called Area X in the novels, and in the, in the film is called The Shimmer. And the shimmer uh, kind of encases this swath of land which has been infected or effected by some kind of alien presence that has caused everything inside the area to mutate um, at the level at the d level of DNA. And so this plays out really quite differently in film and novel. Um, and I think asking different questions about the kind of visuality of the weird versus its linguistic possibilities um, and which different media are able to encapsulate weirdness that I think is really interesting. Um, and I have a couple of notes, but maybe Philip, do you wanna, you've, you've written about on Vandermeer. Do you wanna chime in here? How do you feel? Um, yeah, and I I actually feel closer perhaps to to Van der Meer's books than I feel to that movie, which I actually saw first, and I now I don't remember it very well. Uh, and it's kind of the the memory of the movie has been corrupted by reading the books, which is the other way around than it usually happens for most people, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, what I feel is kind of the most uh, or one of the most important aspects of not only the weird but how the weird links to to the to the ecological thinking and uh, ecological criticism in general this kind of breakdown of of hegemonies of, of like established uh, discourses or, or institutions um, in the face of what is happening right and because uh, these women represent these uh, uh, um, these, these, this authority of, of science and of like state-backed science, so, so also the, the political hegemony as well, uh, and kind of the authority of their, of their expertise um, as well. And, and as, you, as you've said uh, before with, with your comments um, about this, um, this sense of wrongness and this, um, this feeling that, that the world is unknowable, uh, I think that this kind of interestingly uncovers the the, the counter hegemonic uh, potential of of the weird, right? Yeah, and something else that I was thinking about is um, is is how this the eco catastrophe of the um, of the novel and the film as this kind of like. Uh, extraterrestrial arrival. I think it's like a meteor or some kind of thing kind of flying through the sky that lands um, uh, on this piece of land that is um, supposed to be a, a part of Florida along the Gulf, right? Um, that in, and in some ways the Anthropocene cannot simply be attributed to some, in a way it is a kind of singular event, right? It's this like alien arrival, um, but it's not in the same way as it would be to say, okay, we can link this Anthropocene to a singular moment or a singular event, right? A mutated super virus or an oil spill or a bioweapon, right? It's sort of, um, posits that the effects of environmental degradation are so massively distributed um, and so difficult to tackle that it might as well be a kind of extraterrestrial presence or alien presence. Um, and yet what I like about the film and what I think this kind of, um, and the novel is, uh, you know, thinking in terms of zones, right? This is still a kind of highly localized attempt at a kind of case study, right? That attempts to, I think, um, uh, and this is something I've written about before, but always come back to, right? It doesn't reject or moralize the kind of contamination, um, right? Which I think Vandermeer's work in general takes as a starting point that we agree that this is bad, um, but kind of fast tra tracks us to a moment where one is forced to reckon with the disaster um, that they have made. Um, 
you know, and to figure out what, what kind of adaptations are possible, what kind of mutations are possible um, uh, and possibly empowering in some way. It's, it's also interesting if we um, juxtapose uh, annihilate, annihilation with, with something that has, that is kind of, uh, and probably an important cinematic context for it. And I'm, I'm thinking about uh, Tarkovsky's Stalker uh, yeah. here. Um, does the, the analogy between the shimmer and, and the zone in, in Tarkovsky's movie is uh, immediate, right? Yeah. And um, it's interesting how Tarkovsky kind of uh, predicted what happened with, with Chernobyl, for instance, uh, years later, right? Creature that is at the center of uh, of the movie, like, like the shimmer personalized or the alien personalized, uh, and uh, it forms a, a sort of a clone of her. And her first reaction when she starts realizing that uh, that this being is creating a sort of a clone of hers is to fire at it. Uh, with a machine gun, right? Which is sort of this uh, really trite um, science fiction movie cliche, right? But um, it also kind of uh, nicely encapsulates this this unknowability that is at the center of the wheel, and the kind of the, the futility of the attempts at containing it or explaining it or uh, or affecting it uh, in any way. Because also, if we think about uh, how does the weird approach um, the non-human? Um, it's kind of, if, if, if we look at this narrative that humans uh, had this detrimental effect uh, on the you know, environment to, to kind of leave this, these categories at their place for a moment, right? Uh, these narratives are very often like the reverse narrative of, uh, of the human being the victim of, of the non-human world, right? And this is also kind of kind of what it illustrates. Yeah, great. Shall we move on to the second one? So uh, sorry for the ugliness of the slides, but it's just the only way that I know how to do it. So the next piece is uh, The Neglected Garden. It's a short story originally published in 1991 by Katha Koja, another American uh, author of many weird works who has said in interviews that her uh, writing is always concerned with a transformative transcendence and the writer that I love. Um, so this is a short story you can find on Weird Friction Review. It's quite short, but you, you can have full access to it online. If you wanted to find it, post the link um, or whatever. Um, there's not much context in the story, uh, which uh, is kind of typical. So the story begins with a breakup. Um, a man and a woman are breaking up and uh, the man is sort of past this point of tenderness. Like it seems like maybe they've gone through this event many times um, and he's just over it. And the woman just seems to not be able to let go. So that's really the only context we have um, to open up this passage. The man leaves the house and says, I'll be back in an hour basically. And I expect that you know, you'll be gone when I get back and he comes home. And what he finds when he returns is um, quite a different situation. She has crucified herself to the fence in the backyard. Perhaps she was asleep. He leaned closer, not wanting to come too close, but wanting to see and flick the light at her face. Moths were walking across her forehead, pale as her skin, a luminous promenade. A small sound came from him as she opened her eyes. There was a moth beneath her right eyelid. It looked dead. Her hair was braided into the fence, and the puffy circles of infection at her wrists had spread, and gentle blood extending almost to her elbows. There was a slightly viscous shine to the original wounds, the old blood where there had a rusty tinge. The grass seemed greener now, lapping at her bare feet and ankles. When he touched her with the light, she seemed almost to feel it, for she turned her head, not away from the light, as he expected, but into it, as if it was warm and she was cold. No doubt she was cold, if he touched her now. She kept on changing. The infection worsened and then apparently stabilized. At least it spread no further. Her arms, a landscape of green and pale brown, leaves and the supple wood of the creeping growth around about her breasts and waist, her clothing paler and more tattered, softly stained by days of exposure. Flowers were starting to sprout behind her head, strange white flowers like some distorted stylized nimbus of a lady of the back 40. Her feet were a permanent green. It seemed her toenails were gone. It occurred to him. Sorry. 
It occurred to him that he was paying her more attention than ever now, and in a moment of higher anger, he threw a tarp over her big and blue, over her big and blue and plastic, remnant of boating days. It smelled. He didn't care. She smelled too, didn't she? He covered her entirely to the tips of her green toes, left her there. He was no more than 20 steps away when the rustling started, louder and louder, the whole tarp shaking as if by a growing wind. It was horrible to watch, horrible to listen to, and anger still, he snatched it away, looked down at her closed eyes and the spider web in her ear. As he stood there, her mouth opened very slowly and it seemed she would speak. He looked closer and saw a large white flower growing in her mouth, its stem wound around her tongue, which moved feebly as she tried to talk. The white flower wiggled, another slowly unfurled like a time-lapse photo, bigger than the first. Its petals were a richer white, heavy like satin. It brushed against her lower lip and her mouth hung slightly open to accommodate its weight. It looked like she was pouting, a parody of a pout. Back to the garage, looking for the weed killer, the old for stuff he'd used before, herbicide, and he threw it at her, bottle and all, as hard as he could, and stepped back breathing dryly for his mouth to watch. At first, nothing seemed to be happening, only her eyes opening very wide, the eyes of someone surprised by great pain. Then on each spot where the solution had struck, the foliage began not to wither, but to blacken, not the color of death, but an eerily sumptuous shade. And in one instant, every flower in her mouth turned black, a fierce and luminous black, and her eyes were black too, her lips, her hands, black as slowly, as slowly she separated herself from the fence, dragging half of it with her, rising to a shambling crouch, and her tongue free and whipping like a snake as he turned, much too slowly. It was as if his disbelief impeded him, turning back to see in an instant glance that black, black tongue come crawling across the grass, and she behind it with a smile. Thank you. Lovely reading. Philip, do you want to start? How do you, what do you think? Yeah, I, I was a bit surprised by the date in which it was published because the genealogy of the year or the new year, it's quite early, right? Mm -hmm. Lovecraft is way, way earlier, but, but this is pretty early for, for the new year. It's interesting in, in that it, it highlights um, it highlights this this relationship um, with plants, right? That is one of the kind of the aspects of this relationship to to the non-human that is invited by uh, by the anthropocenic turn, but but also obviously by uh, by the weird. And and while animal studies always gets all the attention, and uh, obviously uh, there is there is uh, speculative realism and object-oriented ontology that kind of interrogate the the agency of object uh, of objects um plant studies are are also this interesting growing like field of theory and and of research and i i began thinking about this within this context of of the plant thropocene right which is this uh, uh this 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 notion that was coined by by natasha myers kind of the celebrity of, of plant studies <laughs> uh, we might say i love her work yeah 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 and and she invites this you know it's maybe quite it may seem basic but it's i don't know it's maybe more like essential uh difference that is at the heart of of the um reflection on the anthropocene is, is what is our relationship to plants in that it can be either this relationship of of fostering of kinship not only with plants but all the non-human uh world including like insects soil uh and so on and so forth or is it this relationship of of mastery of uh, um exploitation um that is characteristic for the anthropocene right um so so within that uh, context it's interesting how this text kind of puts forward this uh, anxiety that may accompany this turn towards plants and plant life, right? Which can seem um, scary because it's, I don't know, it's, it seems very collective. Uh, it seems to kind of eschew individuality completely. Um, and th there are certainly um, horror elements within this description, like including this 
towards the end, uh, this this dread that is visible uh, in this one, these, this woman's eyes, but this dread which then turns towards uh, turns to this this smile, right? Uh, so so it seems quite ambiguous, and and this is what's what's interesting uh, to me, like, kind of also confronting it with with the weird and the ambiguity, like the generic ambiguity that is at the heart of it. Right? Yeah, I also think, of course, very much, I mean, I, I've, I wanted to like show this book to anyone that's interested in plants and science fiction that came out um, uh, last, early this year or last year, I can't remember, um, but it, which is all, I think the, one of the first collections, if not the first collection about like plants in SF, and there's actually quite a rich tradition of, um, of thinking plant life, plant and vegetal life, including fungal life um, also separately. And so, yeah, I think you're spot on with um, that, like there's something just so inherently weird about vegetal life already in and of itself, right? It's a kind of ecological, it's an entity that possesses such a host of weird qualities, um, including things like, it's like kind of lim limitless kind of growth and, um, and proliferation, uh, certain distinct uh, non-human temporalities that are far vaster than and the human, um, and all sorts of uh, non-normative and non-reproductive sexual capacities, um, right? Not to mention its questions of, of sentience and agency that are, um, you know, that, that escape us, uh, kind of our human abilities to perceive in a lot of ways, but does not mean that they don't exist. Um, and I sort of get a little bit of, of joy, like seeing, like, you know, on the one hand, I feel like the gender dynamics are kind of boring. Like it feels sort of like 1991, like, okay, it's like a, this like sort of, um, uh, I don't know, it's a couple with the kind of classic wrong, wronged woman and the kind of unaffected man who's just like over it. And, um, and at the same time, I get, I get quite a bit of pleasure in this, like the, the kind of manifestation of the woman's fury in this totally grotesque, beautiful display of vegetation and seeing this sort of like black snake tongue, like at the end, just kind of like emerging and kind of going after, um, after this guy in the end, who's just like struck her with like herbicide, like it's just so weird. Um, so yeah, and then his reactions, I guess partly I would also say part of what strikes me as so bizarre about the story, despite these kind of descriptions of this woman, like, why is she doing this? Um, are the way, are his reactions? Like he, at one point he just like puts a tarp over her. Um, he calls a doctor friend, like after she's been nailed to the fence for 12 days to come and like see what's going on. Uh, he calls the cops at some point, um, and then hangs up because he's, scared that they'll actually come and he just i don't know so it's it's just like he doesn't actually he's confronted with this kind of the weirdness of this becoming plant this kind of ecological transformation um of his wronged girlfriend and then yet responds in just ways that make just no sense at all right so it's no, just like, like the, the herbicide <laughs> there's like a bit of uh loss in translation so yeah 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 definitely definitely yeah um i was also i i also love the like the slowness of this transformation that seem also seems very vegetal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also very weird and that as you were as you were talking, these changes are at the same time very slow and very fast. Um, here, um, again, we, th there is a certain trope here, right? Of, again, of, of transformation, right? That is also, that has been used in horror, but, um, but here, like I, I think that the slowness and kind of the the gentleness of vegetal life kind of also um, in a way um, changes it or affects it somehow, right? That it, that it doesn't seem as as horrifying as as such a transformation usually would, right? Um, yeah, and the smile at the end. I mean, certainly it clues you into that. There's something kind of yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in enchantment. So I always look for these, um, these, these, these fragments which kind of break through this, this horror, right? And this dread and offer something enticing or wondrous or uh, spiritual or religious. Uh, there is this one, uh, one moment in, in this passage um, that is talking about this hair transformation in a sort of a, uh let me go back to this text uh a, a, a figure with a with a, a sort of a, some something like a distorted stylized nimb nimbus that is created by by these strange uh mm. 
white flowers. So it's interesting because these transformations, and there's a lot of them uh, in these examples and, uh, and in New Age texts in general, uh, they very often operate as this sort of um, ascension uh, that is stripped of its religious connotations, really, mm -hmm. but, but has kind of this religious genealogy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we'll see that in sorry. the next test too. So if I can, um, if I can chip in for a moment, because we do yeah, have some please. comments on the in the chat box, so maybe Great. I read them for the recording. Uh, so we have from from Jenny Sperling, so much black color here to in this ending front of her mm. transition. So call it, but not of death, right? Mm. So the um, uh, and uh, from T Fitzpatrick, something knowing about the smile. I have found this aspect in a number of post millennial stories of plant horror. Mm. Mm. You know, and there's also in the clip that I wanted to show the longer clip of Annihilation, there's the, um, Agnieszka, what's the actress's name again that you said? That, uh, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee? The... Yeah, Jennifer Jason Lee is the first to enter. She's the, she's the first to enter the shimmer and she turns around and there is like, and she just smirks. Like, I won't try and do it because I'll look weird, but she gives like the, the most weird, tiny, tiny little hint of a smile, right? So there's there's some kind of, I don't know, uh, I think that, it, you know, we see it also here, this kind of perversity, there's a, a, a something about this kind of like, here we go, or, you know, are you ready for this? Or I don't know, it's, it's, there's something else kind of lurking underneath there, I think in both of these texts. So thanks for those comments on the side. Um, let's move on to the next, um, for the sake of time. Um, I will, let me just find my notes. So perfect, thank you, Ola. Um, so this, let me just find where I am. So our next text, um, uh, I only discovered like maybe a week ago, uh, my friend Rory uh, sent me an article from the uh, New Yorker about Rita and Deanna, who's just released uh, a new album. She is uh, an artist, musician, and uh, novelist. And, um, and so I think I'm really still processing it. It's a short novella. It's um, it's maybe 150 pages or something like this, um, but it's a totally uh, wild ride. And um, the passage that I'll read uh, is a bit a uh, content warning. I just wanted to let you know, it's a bit kind of anatomically and clinically detailed description of a character's transitioning. So if you're squeamish or prefer not to listen to content like this, just feel free to mute me while I read it. It's not as long as the other texts. Um, Rita Indiana is a queer writer, artist, and musician from the Dominican Republic um, whose novel Tentacle that I will read from is translated from the Spanish by Echi Obiejas. Set in the Caribbean sometime between 2027 and 2037, um, though it reaches back to other moments as far as 1606 when buccaneers first landed on the shores of Hispaniola, Tentacle, its original uh, title La Mucama de Ome Kunle from 2015, it was translated um, in 2018, uh, largely follows three successive ecological disasters, including a biological weapons spill um, that is now spreading into the Atlantic in 2037. So they're surrounded by the sea of, uh, of dark, uh, lifeless sludge, um, epidemics, and acid rain. Uh, Tentacle is a gender-bending, time-traveling trip, including African deities and black magic, uh, movement through a toxic hyper-capitalist world of sexual violence, slimy art dealers, brutish sex, and a racism that still prevails despite some of its kind of um, utopian qualities that I'll get to. So primarily it is a story about uh, Asilda who transitions midway through the novel, um, a process involved, involving a magical sea anemone which enables Asilda to travel back in time, uh, formulate a plan to save the oceans uh, for a woman he loves. Um, comes to love in another timeline as Giorgio. Um, and I'll just read quickly this, uh, a reviewer wrote, Sam Ginsberg described this kind of breathlessly and, and Sam writes, with the help of a magical anemone and an exchange for the gender reassignment drug Rainbow Bright, Asilda travels through time, embodies the avatars of a 17th century pirate named Broke and an Italian philanthropist named Giorgio in the early 2000s, all to establish and fund a marine biology lab focused on the preservation of coral reefs and protecting the island from future tidal waves. By manipulating the Dominican art market and possibly forcing one artist into a mental breakdown, Asilda is able to avert the disaster, sorry, spoiler alert, and rethink what it means to control one's body in a hyper-technological future. So I will read this passage out loud. Before the beginning, Eric took a quick look at the jar where the sea anemone rested. It was in bad shape like him and he'd have to act fast. 
As soon as the rainbow bright entered her bloodstream, Asilda began to convulse. I've killed her, thought Eric. They sold me rat poison. But soon she stabilized and he checked her vital signs at intervals. Two hours later, she complained about the heat and later still told him she was burning alive. When the bed began to shake from her tremors, Eric gave her a sedative. At midnight, her small breasts began to fill with smoky bubbles as her mammary glands consumed themselves, leaving a wrinkled web that looked like gum around her nipple, which Eric removed with pinchers so it wouldn't get infected. Underneath grew a masculine skin. Her cells reconfigured themselves like worker bees around her jaw, were uh, her pectorals, her neck, her forearms, and her back filling up to become hard where they were just once soft curves. It was daybreak when the body, confronted with the total annihilation of the female reproductive system, convulsed again. With contractions that made her lower abdomen rise and fall, she expelled what had been her uterus through her vagina. Her labia sealed in a cellular fizz and quickly formed a scrotum, which would give birth to the testicles while her clitoris grew, making her stretching skin bleed. Eric removed the old skin as he had done around her nipples, sterilizing as he went along, as the makers of Rainbow Bright advised. At noon the next day, Asilda Figueroa was wholly a man. Eric protected his designer body, still encased in raw flesh with layers of antiseptics and cotton. Um, Philip? Do you want to respond? Yeah. Um, you haven't read this one yet, right? So this this would be sort of out of context a little bit. Yeah, th this is this <laughs> is fresh for me. Um, but what strikes me is this uh, these echoes of like cyberpunk and and transhumanism that are like, present here like right away because of uh, the fact that uh, that this drug is. Uh, is purchased right that there there seems to be this this black market of drug induced sex change uh, existing there in, in that mm -hmm. world right uh, yeah sort of biohacking sort of DIY and like designer body kind of as a as a keyword of cyberpunk right um, so so there's there's definitely that I uh, I'm kind of trying to 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 wrap my head around this because because obviously I mean drug-induced sex change uh, seems like a very cool and interesting novum here, right? Um, but um, I was thinking about whether I, I don't, uh, um, whether, whether I, I, I perceive a sort of a gender essentialism here in, in certain, at certain points, right? I mean, it, it gets very, uh, very essentialist in in describing the 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 feminine uh, feminine bodily uh, features as a soft and the male as 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 like as hard and also thinking about the the plot of of, of this novella uh, in which the the protagonist has to become a man physically to kind of assume this role of the action hero right so i i don't want to to pass judgment just by uh, reading this uh this excerpt so, so i'm kind of wondering how it relates mm. to to the rest of the of the text right yeah i mean the text um as i said there's i think there's a lot of fun and promise and wildness to the novel that I really love. And then there's also a lot of kind of narrative threads and characters that are not really fully developed or explained. You're left sort of wondering um, uh, what is going to happen, I guess. Um, but I think that there's um, uh, um, like this particular piece, this particular passage, what I like about it um, is that it, it kind of imagines, I think, this kind of transformative transgender body as a kind of, number one, in the future at all. This is like a future that involves trans people and that also requires that, you know, that they can go back, this trans, this trans person through this transformation um, and, and not through a romanticizing of the process of transitioning. It's in fact quite, quite visceral and hard to imagine, but that it's connected to the ecological future, right? Um, and that even though I think the novel presents quite a few uneven, still um, even violent gender relations and misogyny, which is sort of alive and well, um, it's not a kind of utopia, but a story about um, a kind of dramatic transformation as both spiritual, um, uh, which is in fact the thing that will allow him to go back in time and save the oceans, right? So that the ecological future depends on this kind of transformation. Um, 
Um, Oh yeah, and so this the same writer Samuel Ginsburg wrote that. Um, so the original title, um, which had a different meaning, but so that tentacle, translating it to tentacle, places the spotlight on this anemone actually on the anemone itself. That is part of this, like you know, the anemone is in the room during the transformation, but it's unclear like what it's doing. If it's just a kind of presence, or you know, you don't know what the anemone is needed for. It could have sold on the black market for sixty thousand dollars but they stole it um, and so they needed it to complete this transformation. Um, but it is a magic imbued aquatic creature, creature that uh, grants the protagonist access to spiritual realms and time traveling powers, highlighting the importance of the sea with Afro-Caribbean religious traditions, along with the connection um, between ecology and the project to create a more sustainable um, Dominican future. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's something about the kind of chaotic time jumping that um, Asilda is allowed that, um, you know, that is really specific to what the weird is going to be able to do to tell this kind of really complicated history of the Dominican Republic's past and future. And I think this is what some of the um, reviews that I've read have picked up on. Yeah, it's also interesting to, th to think about this um, this dual aspect of, of these transitions, right, that we are already talking about. And here also, there are some clearly um, horror related or, or horrific um, aspects of this transformation, right? With this like birth of the uterus, which, which seems very, very abject, right? Uh, but also, um, it also seems through using this very precise medical language and uh, using these metaphors like you know like uh, her cells reconfigured uh, like like worker bees right uh, it also seems very matter of fact in a way um which is also um, also interesting right i, I don't uh, i don't know yet where to take this i was also thinking yeah i don't know yeah. <laughs> yeah i was thinking about uh, hybridity because this is something that um, the weird fictions uh, research group was investigating pr previously in one of the, yeah. the past semesters. Uh, and I was thinking about how hybrid is the, 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 this, um, this, this protagonist is, right? Because in a way this, this is like uh, right at the heart of hybridity, this transformation, but at the same time, this emphasis on, um, on the fact that, um, she fully became a man, like the Asil de Figueroa was wholly a man. Uh, and again, I'm not sure how the the text approaches it later, like with pronouns, etc. And, and yeah, he, yeah, yeah, well, he yeah. becomes actually two other men in different time periods. So in the 1600s, and then sometime maybe 50 years prior, I think. So, all right. So, uh, so again, paradoxical <laughs> and. Uh, in a way, uh, speaks to hybridity, but at the same time, is seems fascinated with these um, like contained essentialist identities, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a fair um, a fair critique, possibly. And I see this also question on the side on the sidebar, um, which I'll just answer quickly and then read our last passage just to save time for us to talk. Um, uh, I don't think that it does. The question is, does it suggest that traditional female gender associations with nature must be disguised within a masculine frame in order to succeed? And how important is the sea anemone in the transformation? Um, and no, I don't think so. I don't think it does. It does this um, in short. In short answer to the first and the second part of the question um, is crucial. I mean, they have to murder someone in order to steal this anemone. Um, and so, but again, it. It's, um, you know, not really quite explained what, what it does or what it's there for. So, um, so let's move on to the last um, slide, which might, I think it's two different slides. Um, so we might have to change in between. Is there anyone that feels like reading? I can read it. if it Yeah. Works. Okay, cool. Thanks, Philip. Um, oh, should I give a little, maybe I should just say what the novel's about. Do you think? Okay, I'll just find a, <laughs> uh, find a backup copy of the... Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll just say, um, let me just see. I, uh, so, so this is a novel. Um, this is a novel by N.K. Jemison. She is another American um, SF writer who won the Hugo Award three years in a row for each book of the Broken Earth trilogy, which is amazing and highly recommend. Um, and this is her latest novel. It came out earlier this year. 
uh, which is a very clear uh, revisionist, revisionary weird project. It takes place in what is called Capital Weird New York, um, and regularly throughout the text um, cites Lovecraft stories and monsters um, in a way that is clearly rejecting them, and yet um, is still very much engaging in the weird mode. And um, so this novel is the first of, the of what will be a trilogy that Jemison says in the acknowledgments is an, hom an homage to New York. Um, and it follows five people uh, who are the city of, the, of New York, right? So they each embody, they're actually the city, they're each a borough of New York that need to kind of unite in this, I don't know, sort of like Avengers sort of style way to, um, to fight the enemy who um, is uh, known as the white woman. And she is uh, a manifestation of a kind of um, Lovecraftian city called uh, Rulie. It's the ancient sunken city from Call of Cthulhu. So um, I've just chosen two passages that, um, that kind of describe what this threat looks like. The mass of tendrils is growing as many watches. There is a low crumbly sound that he, ca he can hear from that direction, now and again when the wind carries it to him. Probably the sound of roots digging into asphalt, and probably into the rebar within the asphalt, and maybe into the bedrock that's under the road. He can hear the tendrils too, now that they're close enough. A choppy broken groan, stuttering and occasionally clicking like a corrupted music file. He can smell it, a thicker, much fishier brine scent than the, that of the nearby East River. The tendril mass looms, ethereal and pale, more frightening as the cab accelerates. There is a beauty to it, he must admit, like some haunting bioluminescent deep sea organism dragged to the surface. It is an alien beauty, however, meant for some other environment, some other ether, and here in New York, its presence a contaminant, a contaminant. The very air around it has turned gray, and now that they're closer, he can hear the air hissing as if the tendrils are somehow hurting the molecules of nitrogen and oxygen they touch. Manny's been in New York for less than an hour, and yet he knows, he knows that cities are organic, dynamic systems. They are built to incorporate newness, that some new things become part of, this, part of a city, helping it grow and strengthen, while some new things can tear it apart. And then we have another excerpt. Yeah, next slide, if you don't mind. Oh, perfect, you're on it. Thank you. Because now that she's gotten a good look at it, there is something like a three foot wide spider moving around the backyard that her daughter leans out over. It has only four legs. If, if those even qualify as legs. They don't taper. They don't bend as they come away from the tiny central body. The whole creature must be lying on the ground, spread out along the concrete flagstones in a flat cross. That's all it is. But when it moves, it is vaguely spider-like, contracting into a single flat line and then scissoring out into four lines again, all joined at a small rounded hub. An eldritch daddy long legs, brought to you by the letter X. The moment Jojo slides the window closed, the white X spiders in the backyard react, shivering and then Xing forward a few steps. There are three now, Brooklyn sees. Another has just folded its front two legs over the lip of a wooden planter that it was apparently hidden behind. She's guessed that they are now, though. She's guessed what they are now, though. They have a different shape from the white feathers that menaced at her at the two train station and surrounded Manhattan and Inwood Hill Park. But they feel the same prickling, jangly antithesis uh, of presence that, but they feel the same prickling, jangling antithesis of presence that everything else associated with the enemy seems to radiate. As if they erase some tiny part of New York with every iota of its space they occupy. Thank you. Just making a note here of something I want to rem remember to say. Um, yeah, so I thought I would end um, our, our, our passages um, with something that is um, perhaps less obviously ecological, uh, a passage that is about a, a kind of urban ecology or city as ecology. Um, in which some kind of threat is bursting to kind of break through the asphalt, the cracks of the asphalt. It's threatening the very architecture and infrastructures of the city. Um, in the novel, these white tendrils, they take over trains and redirect them. Um, they uh, infect passersby uh, with these, you know, um, 
the people that can see the monster, the monstrous kind of tendrils, they sneak out from the bottom of a pant leg or you see them kind of coming through the top. So they're these kind of infectious, um, uh, yeah, and a kind of infectious um, contaminant that a lot of people are reading now alongside, of course, um, you know, uh, COVID fears and the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but what I like is, is to think about um, cities themselves and kind of um, uh, pulsating living being ways, the ways in which it might disrupt the, um, uh, the kind of natural versus unnatural ways that I think we're used to thinking about um, ecologies. And I'd be really curious to know what um, people's reactions were uh, to this novel if they've read it. Did, have you read this one, Philip? Or? No, I haven't. I love Jemison and I am very much looking forward to, to, reading, to reading it. I know some of our uh, members, some of the members of our research group have read this novel and have some opinions on it. I don't I'd know be so curious. Yeah, I haven't talked to anyone about it really yet. And I actually didn't read any reviews and only finally, I mean, I started reading the novel um, quite some time ago and then only just got back to it recently. So um, yeah, it's totally different than, than things that I've read of hers in the past. It's, um, it's kind of a playful re reappropriation, a kind of playful revision of the weird in a lot of ways. Um, that I was maybe not expecting um, completely. Yeah, but the, the city ecology aspect seems uh, seems to radiate from this passage right away, right? And uh, here we have this, like, again, uh, here we have this equilibrium that is not disturbed by, uh, by the human as it is really, right, in, in reality, but, uh, but rather disturbed by this alien force, this this enemy, right, and this uh, this kind of rever reversal of uh, of the ecological disaster, right? Um, that that is something that that kind of uh, struck me. Uh, we also have these clear uh, weird reference points in, in these passages with uh, a very new weird uh, sentence at the end. Um, with this jangling antithesis of presence, right? Yeah. Which is like yeah. something to quote in a, in a book about. Um, yeah, I, this, I read this and I, I'm thinking very much about absence and lack, um, both in terms of the weird is unable to represent and the kind of lack and absence that it always kind of carries with it. And, and so um, I was really interested also to, this is like a key buzzword that I, that I read and I said, it's actually um, also in, uh, italicized in the text. So it's super important. <laughs> yeah, and then also there is this, this playful uh, reference to uh, Eldritch Daddy Long Legs, right? Which also seems very Lovecraftian. Yeah, these are throughout. It's like, it's very funny the way that, you know, the novel says things constantly like, like the characters just like, oh, fuck this Eldritch, Eldritch shit over here. I mean, this is like how they talk about it. So it's this very kind of, um, you know, this is how the Bronx talks. This is how the Queen, how Queens talks. This is how, you know, and so um, it's a kind of really interesting way of, um, I think, approaching and revising certain Lovecraft texts with a bit of um, playfulness and, um, you know, I don't know if that's the right word, but but anyway, but maybe we should. Do you have any last thoughts about um, this one? Maybe we should open it up because it's it's yeah. Uh, maybe last last thought. Uh, I'm obviously always scanning for enchantment whenever yeah. I read. have you found any? Uh, yes, there is this uh, unexpected beauty and what's happening, and this is um, yeah. this uh, makes me uh, think that that I should really. Uh, I should read it and, and probably analyze it because I, I will be writing about Jemison and Broken Earth. So, uh, Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So maybe we should um, open it up unless if that's okay with you, Agnieszka, are you happy to? Cool. I mean, because I was thinking that one, one way to start is to just see if there, because we haven't really had a chance to, we talked a little bit long, but to see if there are um, connections that people might want to draw or just general start with just kind of general observations about things that you've heard or read. Um, of course, if there's immediate questions of clarification, please feel free to ask, but, but maybe things that we might draw together about the texts um, that, you know, these four kind of random texts together. The relationship to ecology and the weird kind of comments, observations. Um, so while we wait for questions to appear, I, I actually have a question. <laughs> So if I uh, if I can start, um, I I haven't read Rita, Rita Indiana's uh, novel yet, but I I've read the other two, and and actually, I'm one of those people who dislike um, uh, N.K. Jemisin's new book. I I thought it was a little bit too on the nose for me. 
Yeah, I just wanted to just kind of trash talk um, N.K. Jemisin's latest book. I, I, I kind of, you know, I, I didn't like it. Um, yeah, I, I think Broken Earth Trilogy kind of kind of broke me. Like, like I loved it so much that I had such high expectations and I was expecting something very similar. And then I read the book and I was like, mm, it's a little bit too on the nose. Like, I know it's playful, but at the same time, I was like, very yeah. Hand. But she did it in such a beautiful, subtle, engaging, emotional, intense way. All the, the same things, right? She did the same things in the earlier trilogy, but she did them in a way that, that wasn't so on the nose. But I, but it's me. As a reader, I, I'm just, uh, I, I've noticed that I dislike novels which are a little bit on the nose. I don't get the humor, probably. I don't know. Do but actually, it's like just sort of, do you mean like heavy handed, just sort of like it's yeah. very obvious what you're up to? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you if, if you've read uh, Ruth, Ruth what, what's the name of that uh, author? Ruth Anna Emrys, Wintertide. Mm-hmm. It's like um, it's like a re-envisioning of uh, Lovecraftian mythos, but from the perspective of the of the Innsmouth um, inhabitants. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, on paper. It should be perfect. Like you have like everything there but then again it's um you, you might want to look it up because i i, I find mm-hmm. a lot of similarities between what jemison is doing and what um uh, emrys did in the winter tide which is part of a duology as far as i remember and it's, it was published by tor i think mm-hmm. uh, but my, my question is about something that you mentioned in the beginning of your talk uh, and i wanted to kind of come back to it because you mentioned um queer theory and, and um, ways of looking how to join queer theory and and the weird mm-hmm. and I was wondering about that in the fragments that we've seen so of course the the kind of obvious candidate would be uh, Rita Indiana's um, novel so maybe you can you can talk about this a little bit more because I'm, I'm kind of interested in those connections about the um, well, my my kid stole my notes, so I I'm trying to reconstruct it from memory. But she said something about kinky nature, right? Kinky nature and how um, it might be kind of destabilizing genders or sexual orientations through its kind of toxic, toxicity. And I was wondering if you see kind of if if you've seen similar themes in Rita Indiana's novel. If you can talk about this a little bit more, it would be great. Yeah, sure. Um... So this, yeah, developing this kind of line between the queer and the weird is the introduction, um, is the introduction to the book. So it's, which is still sort of underway. I have all the chapters done, but I'm redoing the conclusion and the intro. So, and I've been working on it for, for ages and I, and I still kind of struggle to talk about it. So I'll, I'll try my best. Um, um, yeah, so I think the, what brought me to, to thinking about the two together was originally working in queer time and queer temporality and thinking about a kind of backwardness, um, a kind of anti-teleological sense of um, thinking about, um, uh, yeah, thinking about it could be nature, it could be ecologically, it could be otherwise. Um, but uh, I would say uh, one good example of this that has helped me a lot is Mel Chen's work. And so thinking about this, um, this chapter that Mel Chen has on lead in this book, Animacies, which I think was 20, I don't know what year it was, 2013, maybe something like this. Um, and there's and 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 Mel is describing uh, living this experience of multiple chemical chemical sensitivity MCS, um, which is largely a kind of response to environmental toxicity, but has no uh, it, it it's impossible to kind of trace right. It doesn't have some kind of origin or moment of beginning necessarily right. You don't know exactly how or why this kind of condition comes to define your life, but um, Mel d- just just kind of details this whole experience. And um, and then in this chapter on lead, uh, describes uh, feeling uh, so so sick one one day that they uh, fall asleep on the couch and and kind of wake up on the couch and think that the couch is their girlfriend actually, and starts to describe the ways in which the kind of toxic toxicity of the body um, and the Anthropocene. And I don't actually think that Mel uses the word Anthropocene. I can't really remember now. Um, but the ways in which the kinds of toxicity of the an- of the Anthropocene engender or make possible uh, w- forms of attachment that Mel doesn't call weird, but that I would say open up all sorts of weird avenues, right, for different kinds of attachments, different kind of intimacies, um, whether it be with couches or with, um, you know, plants or or whatever it is, and not necessarily all sexual, but in some kind of some kind of queer attachment form. So, um, so I think that's why the this kind of weird uh, ecology and weird biology stuff, with from, which for me is always inf- inflected with contamination and the toxic um, 
uh, yeah, like uh, for me, it, it just like pushes me towards thinking about these other kinds of weird or kinky or perverse desires that might become, you know, possible um, for better or worse through those avenues. Yeah, but it, as far as the passages go, I mean, um, you know, I think actually all four texts probably have uh, in, in other passages have a lot of connections to be made between them, but let me think on it for a second. So in, in the in the meantime, I can um, maybe copy, um, paste copy and information about the movie, which I kind of immediately thought about when you mentioned this kind of couch episode. It's a kind oh, yeah. of new movie. I'm, I'm not sure if it's Belgian or French, but it's about a woman who's fascinated with carousels and she works at an amusement park and she falls in love with a, a, a carousel. And, um, and it's, you know, and she kind of, I haven't seen it yet, I've just seen the trailer, I just kind of learned about it like, you know, two hours ago. Just immediately before the um, before our talk, and um, and and we're kind of wondering about this um, this trope, right? Uh, if yeah, you or can, Annie Sprinkle's work maybe would be another fun one, yeah. to look at, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is like kind of out there. Um, and yeah, there's all sorts of. I was at an exhibition at at, um, at Gropius Bau, uh, and I'll try and remember the artist uh, before the session is over and see if I can post the link. But who it was just all about like kind of sexual queer encounters with ferns, so like gay men that would have sex with ferns um, in video work, and this kind of just big room of an installation of ferns and plants, a lot of tendrils there as well. Um, so so yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot there that's working with this kind of interspecies, of course, this kind of interspecies intimate in ways that you have to be quite careful about, but still I think are quite interesting. Any comments generally or feedback on um, any of the any of the texts that you that anyone read or haven't read or had any responses to? Maybe we have some questions. Um, we still have a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. There's a question in the chat box about Timothy Morton um, um, coexisting from. Um, oh, that's great. <laughs> Steve says he just told Kathy Koja that we were talking about her story and she was pleased. So that's lovely. Um, so th uh, this question from T. Fitzpatrick, that there is a strong element of T. Morton's coexisting. From what I have heard, I only know the Annihilation text, the Gothic angle of the transgressive coexistence of human plant could maybe be seen as interrogating our attitudes towards LGBTQ+. Yeah, this is a great, uh, a really smart and great point. Um, that I can just say in in my in my manuscript, I have a chapter on Juna Barnes and uh, lesbian plant proliferation and fungus, and so I'm totally obsessed with um, thinking about the ways in which, um, at least in a lot of Barnes texts, uh, not just her novel, not just Nightwood, although I focus on this, but um, also in her woodcuts and um, some of her poetry as well, that the the kind of um, that there's a kind of fear of the proliferation of of queerness, right? And it, it and it becomes manifest in describing the queer bodies in 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 her work and and paint and, and the woodcuts of these bodies in her work as being very like rooted in the earth or having um, all sorts of these. Um, uh, you know, of course, plant and fungal kingdoms are different, but that kind of fungal sporous um, uh, kind of outpourings and all sorts of weird stuff like this, which is, I think, also, uh, you know, related to questions of queer decadence and um, and all sorts of other things. So I think absolutely the, the plant studies stuff. Um, my chapter, my chapter in this book is called Queer Ingestions, and it's all about plant bodies um, and queerness in Van Jeff Vandermeer. So um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk more about that with you on the side. I'm totally, yeah, a rhizomatic quality for sure. Yeah. Uh, this Asia is asking a question or Asia. Um, I wonder if you know the, the book um, uh, Kawakami record of A Night Too Brief. I don't know it. No. Does anyone else know it? No, I don't know it. I guess maybe I should. Okay, great. <laughs> Weird animals and lesbian fungi. That's totally what I want. Thank you. I will look it up. Thank you. Actually, speaking of fungi, uh, I was wondering if there is any critical critical connection between the fact that these are gay characters that are tasked with uh, maintaining the, the fungi or the spore drive in Star Trek Discovery, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know if, if there is anywhere to take this, uh, this observation, but. Yeah, I have a piece coming out in this um, Star Trek handbook and with Rutledge. And um, there's a section, I, I wanted to write the whole chapter on just this exact question, Philip. So you're like onto me. Um, but yes, no, I'm very interested in how this kind of, um, the ways in which this supposedly sustainable um, uh, power of the future um, that drives these, the, that drives the spore drive, that drives the ships in this, in Star Trek Discovery, um, well, the past and the future, anyway. Um, it's very much like embroiled in this kind of love affair between two gay characters and that it actually requires the um, the gay man body to power it. Like he's actually the one that is connected to the mycelial network. And so, um, yeah, I'm very, very much, I'm very much into this. this. This is very interesting to me. I'll send you the piece and <laughs> we could talk about it. <laughs> I'll take everything. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, it looks like yeah. maybe it's dinner time, huh? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of um, ah, sorry to kind of mention quickly something about fungi because yeah. I, I can see that there is like a, a bit of a renaissance in, in the kind of weird fiction, horror fiction in general. Uh, I'm sure some of you, probably a lot of you know Mexican Gothic by Silvia Morena Garcia. Um, and um, I, I strongly recommend it. Oh, it, it, it's, it the quite, it's kind of, it casts the, the main action in, in terms of a kind of, you know, heterosexual plot let's call it right so we don't really have a, like a lot of queer elements although you could argue that the that the queerness is the is the fungi itself so and there's going to be a movie uh, tv adaptation of this of this tv show so i'm, I'm kind of looking forward to how the visuals are going to be presented so yeah oh we have one more question so i think i think we still have time maybe for one because we started a little bit earlier but i think that would have to be the last one Oh, I see. Um, oh boy, yeah. I wonder if you could comment on an object-oriented ontology as a mode of reading new weird fiction. Um, yes, I can. Um, so the first piece that I published was a piece on, um, on object-oriented ontology, uh, feminism and reading Lovecraft, and it's called Lovecraft's Weird Body, and you can read it on um, um, Rhizomes, so it's free online to read, Rhizomes, uh, Cultural Studies for Emerging Knowledge. I can't remember the exact name of the journal. Um, which came out, I think, in 2017. So yeah, um, there's a lot I have, you know, along with everyone else, I have a lot of kind of critiques of object-oriented ontology as a general um, methodology, but it's also informed my thinking a lot. And so, um, you know, I've, I've read all the object-oriented ontologists, including um, Catherine Behar's book, which is called OOF, Object-Oriented Feminisms, which I uh, really recommend as a really nice um, supplement to um, thinking a lot of the kind of male-oriented um, white male oriented uh, field of, of the OOO. But it, it has helped, it did help me a lot, um, for sure, as I was encountering weird fiction. And um, I guess for me, the, uh, one of the critiques that I found was that it was unable to, to kind of confront and address the problems of, uh, of the weirds. Racism, for instance, um, in favor, it, it seemed to me as a field kind of in favor of um, uh, an investment in the formal qualities of the weird, which I'm also invested in, uh, and less so in some of the kind of um, social and political implications of, of thinking pure form of the weird. I guess that would be a short answer, <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Okay, so I think we have to finish uh, because we're 90 minutes uh, up. Um, thank you so much, Ali and Philip Bohr, um, for participating in our event today. Thank you everyone for listening and asking questions. And uh, for those of you who missed parts of it, I would like to kind of rewatch uh, everything. We'll be uploading, hopefully, the, the whole recording in a couple of days' time. Um, and uh, I hope to see all of you in two weeks' time for our next installment. Uh, so thank you once again. Have a great evening. Thanks morning everyone. or Thank afternoon. You, You're the best. Thanks, Agnieszka. See you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.